Starting now on Guam's primetime news, your elected senators head into emergency session to debate the legislation to recall the mayor of Jotnia. Plus, an antiquated mobile radio communication system for emergency responders has crashed. And a bankruptcy reorganization plan will help the Archdiocese of Agania settle more than 200 clergy sex abuse cases. Hafiday and good evening. I'm Adriana Cotero. Healthy debate on acting speaker Talina Nelson's recall election bill. Senators going into committee of the whole with discussions centering on funding for the recall and if there is even a need for one. Here's more. Senators debating first if an emergency even exists in the village of Jotnia. The village essentially mayorless since September when Mayor Jesse Blas was jailed on extortion and bribery charges. The federal court ruling him too dangerous to release. And so he's been locked up since then, with his trial slated to start in February. Minority leader Senator Tello Taidegui raising issues with the cost of the recall and the special election that would follow a successful recall of Mayor Blas. But bill sponsor and acting speaker Talina Nelson said the combined price tag was justified because, quote, at least we heard the people's voice for the price of $25,000. Now, if $25,000 is such a big number to us, then we should debate other issues that are going on in our government for frivolous matters and how money is being spent, end quote. Taidegui also raised concerns that the situation in Jotnia was being mischaracterized. Taidegui saying only one resident of the village showed up for the bill's public hearing. But Nelson countered by saying she held several meetings in the village and that residents expressed the desire to have the option to recall their mayor. Meanwhile, Mayor's Council Oversight Chair Senator Peter Terlahi grilled Police Chief Stephen Ignacio on the number of crimes being reported to GPD in the village. Ignacio said crimes have remained at about the same level with or without a mayor. Debate also touched on exactly when senators would have to pass a recall measure in order to meet the timelines laid out in law. Nelson said the bill would have to be passed by January 24th. For Guam's News Network, Chris Barnett reports. The Guam Police Department's Motorola SmartNet radio communication system crashed at around 1230 today. The radio communication system is also used by the Guam Fire Department. Police Chief Steve Ignacio told KUAM they are working to restore the system, which we should note they've been using for about 30 years. The chief says, however, when it crashed, they immediately deployed their backup communication system or pushed to talk radio to officers. As of news time, the system was still down. And the Archdiocese of Hagania is offering $21 million to settle the more than 200 clergy sex abuse lawsuits. The figures are contained in a disclosure statement and bankruptcy reorganization plan filed Thursday with the Guam District Court. Nestor Lacanta reports. According to court documents, $7 million will come directly from the Archdiocese, which in December sold the former Redemptorist Modern Seminary for $5.7 million. $13 million will come from insurance, and another $1 million will be due from the parishes. Another lawsuit is pending against the church to include local Catholic schools and parishes to increase the settlement fund, but Archdiocese Attorney Ford El Sasser says the church opposes that. We firmly believe that the parishes and schools, are they own their own property, to put it simply. I mean, they have their own bank accounts. You know, they raise the money to build the parishes. They raise the money to to build the schools. We're going to be obviously resisting that litigation. El Saucer could not discuss specifics of the disclosure statement and bankruptcy reorganization plan, but did say they're hoping for a single overall settlement for all matters. We are hopeful of getting back to the mediation uh, table and resolve uh, through a uh, mediation with the court appointed mediator, Judge Harris. But El Sasser says no new mediations or court hearings are currently scheduled, and he wouldn't speculate how long it may take to resolve. I, you know, remain hopeful and optimistic, but sometimes these cases take longer than other times. The sexual abuse allegations date back decades, a majority implicating now deceased former priest Louis Briard, as well as now defrocked Archbishop Anthony Aperon. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lacanto. The next hearing for the church bankruptcy case has been scheduled for February 21st. Sentenced to life in prison, a conviction, Ayla Cimarron tells the court he plans to appeal. Cimarron appeared before Judge Maria Senzon this morning. Here's more. Ayla Cimarron, along with co-defendant Malo Sally, were charged for the 2017 murder of Gilbert Alvarez. The two beat Alvarez and stole his truck, and it was an early morning jogger in Mingilao that discovered the victim lifeless on the side of the road.
Cimarron was sentenced back in June. However, during a further proceedings hearing, it was disclosed that there was a mishap with the charges. According to alternate public defender Anna Maria Gale, there were nine charges in total Cimarron faced. And out of the nine, he was uh, convicted of murder, manslaughter, aggravated assault, theft of a motor vehicle, aggravated assault, and then aggravated assault, the lesser included, which would have been a misdemeanor assault. When Cimarron was sentenced in June, it was unclear if he was found guilty of a misdemeanor assault as a lesser included charge for one of the aggravated assault felony convictions. Today, Cimarron returned and it was corrected. He was sentenced to life in prison with eligibility for parole after 20 years served. Attorney Gale told the court that they are reserving any objection because while her client does want to file a notice of appeal, he has written a letter requesting her office be off the case. He just said, I don't want you to be my lawyer. And, uh... He, he, just, he just didn't want us to be his um, appellate lawyer. He didn't give a reason. He didn't give a reason. Representing the government, Assistant Attorney General Sean Brown says they are waiting for any appeal to determine restitution. As for the co-defendant, Sally had entered a plea agreement and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. More from Superior Court. Jury selection is underway for the government's second try at Mark Torrey Jr.'s case. Torrey has asserted his rights to a speedy trial in which an amended indictment charges him with negligent homicide and aggravated assault for the 2015 fatal shooting of fellow police officer Albert Piolo. Trial is expected to begin next week. However, there are two motions pending, a decision in order by Judge Michael Bordalio. As we've reported, this includes whether or not the edited body cam footage will be allowed as evidence, as well as if Dr. Ariola Espinola's previous testimony may be used. And the police report was filed six months ago, but on Tuesday, 80-year-old widower Daniel Guerrero shared his story with KUAM, and 24 hours later, an arrest was made. Guerrero shared his surveillance video with KUAM showing a woman who broke into his home and stole more than $30,000 of his personal belongings. In July, he told police who the suspect was, and he has been waiting for police to make an arrest. According to court documents, Georgina Maria Charferes, a.k.a. Georgina Maria Cundiff, a.k.a. several other aliases, has been charged with burglary, theft, and identity theft. She was also linked in charge to a November identity theft case. Meanwhile, court documents state Georgina claims she went to Guerrero's house to clean it but wasn't home. She went inside and took a Rolex watch and pawned it because of financial problems and ice. Carrying 8.6 grams of meth in her car and more than a grand in cash, 37-year-old Janessa Dazzle Tydenko was arrested on a charge of possession of Schedule II controlled substance with intent to deliver. On January 16th, police pulled over her blue Toyota Corolla near the Hagania precinct because it was missing a front license plate and brake light was out. Court documents state Tydenko consented to a car search. A large bag with a smaller Ziploc bags containing suspected meth was found. At first, Tydenko denied owning anything in the car, but later admitted the drugs were hers, and the money in her purse was from drug proceeds. Court documents state she admitted she deals drugs from her home. And some Guam Historic Preservation Office staffers are threatening to quit if former SHPO Linda Ogan is reinstated. A letter to the governor signed by some employees of the Department of Parks and Rec's Historic Resources Division calls Ogan's potential return to the job as, quote, not workable and says there was a consensus of the employees that we could no longer work with Ms. Ogan. Those are words from the letter penned by state archaeologist John Mark Joseph. Meanwhile, Ogden's attorney, John Bell, responded with the following statement about the letter and its contents. Quote, it looks like self-serving propaganda, which the employees were likely pressured to sign. Mr. Joseph lacks credibility, and it's hard to say these hearsay comments seriously. They have no legal relevance at this point, Bell said. The Hagania Restoration and Redevelopment Authority has been slapped with a legislative subpoena. Oversight Chair Senator Kelly Marsh Titano says the committee has been waiting almost a year to review half a million dollars in planning documents for the redesign of Hagania, and they're tired of being ignored. Nestor Lacanto reports. Senator Marsh Titano says she's asked informally, formally, sent freedom of information requests, and now a subpoena all because she keeps getting the cold shoulder from HRRA Executive Director Lasha Kassil. The responses that we get is by us asking for transparency 
that we're interfering with their mission, that they're not able to do their work, that uh, we haven't given them enough money to do their work, although they have more staff than they have had in at least nine years, if not ever. She says all the committee wants is to make sure that the $500,000 recently paid out for the design of a revitalized Haganya was money well spent because, she says, there are indications it may not have been. As we've gone through the master plan with uh, some expert reviewers, as we've seen some of the reviews coming in, there are what I would call some pretty grave concerns. She says there was also some 196000 paid for work the board was not told about. So if documents that might not have been fully reviewed, that were not seen by the board directors and that are being kept from us, what, what is all of that lack of transparency about? I find it really shocking that we're here a year later. Marsh Titano has scheduled an oversight hearing for next week. Casil was off island and not available for comment, but is expected to return Friday evening. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lacanto. Thank you, Nestor. Stick around for more news here on Primetime. You're watching KUAM. Get up to the minute news, plus access to alerts. club. Half a day, welcome to Two Lovers Point. Half a day, I'm in the club. It's a special delivery to your inbox every week with your KUAM News Roundup, program advisories, and promotions. Sign up for the weekly KUAM Digital Digest today on KUAM.com. The Governor's Chief of Staff, Tony Babauta, says the Aganya pool was closed today after they received an email on Thursday from a concerned parent suspecting their child got a rash and an ear infection after swimming in the Aganya pool. The Department of Parks and, Re and Recreation sent a press release at around 8.30 last night that Guam EPA was conducting water quality tests. DPR Director Richard Ibanez says there's nothing more important than the safety of pool patrons. Babata says no other complaints had been received prior to the incident. DPR is expected to announce later when the pool will reopen. And public health alerts the public that six people fell ill on December 23rd from suspected fish poisoning. Any reef fish can cause cigotera poisoning, but species such as barracuda, grouper, red snapper, moray eel, amberjack, parrotfish, hogfish, sturgeonfish, kingfish, coral trout, and sea bass are the most commonly affected. Public health warns anyone who consumes fish contaminated with cigotera toxin will become ill. Symptoms include tingling and numbness in fingers, toes, around lips, tongue, mouth, and throat, nausea, abdominal cramps, joint pains, headache, and difficulty breathing. To prevent fish poisoning, public health recommends avoid eating the head, row, or of fish egg, liver, or other organs of the fish as it is where the highest level of toxin is present. And it was last night on primetime we shared the story of Zeus and, now, and how he was viciously beaten with rocks and doused in gasoline on Tuesday night. Zeus's owner, Rosanne Iker Tang, provided an update to KOAM saying, quote, I wanted to extend my appreciation to the people of Guam for their love, prayers, thoughts, support, and donations for Zeus. Without you all, he wouldn't have gotten the care he needed to recover and return home to me and my daughter. For this, we are forever grateful. She adds that as a result of the community's generosity, all of Zeus's medical bills are paid for and donations are now closed. Guam Animals in Need is offering a $1,000 reward for information leading to the arrest or indictment of the persons responsible for attacking Zeus. And anyone with information is urged to call GAIN at 653-4246 or Guam Crime Stoppers at guam.crimestoppers.web. 
A technical review of candidate packets will be completed before the Guam Election Commission approves them for pickup. GEC staff tells KYM the packets, which are for candidates seeking elected office in the 2020 elections, will be available next Friday. The packets include nominating petitions, candidate handbook, certification of qualification, campaign finance manual, organizational report forms, campaign contribution and expenditure forms, public official disclosure, public official disclosure, candidate information card, affidavit of non-conviction, and candidate filing checklist. According to the GEC, some 26 candidates have filed their intent to seek elected office, including eight incumbent senators and Congressman Mike San Nicolas. The Surgeon General of the Navy Rear Admiral Bruce Gillingham is on Guam. He visited with the crew of the fast attack submarine USS Oklahoma City today. According to a media release, Gillingham visited medical commands around the island to discuss his priorities for the medical community and how they relate to maritime superiority and fleet-wide medical readiness. Gillingham is the Navy's 39th Surgeon General. The Guam Power Authority's revenue bonds were upgraded by Fitch Rating Services to a BBB with a stable outlook. GPA General Manager John Benaventi says the improved investment grade rating is a positive confirmation of the agency's operational improvements and commitment to strengthen its financial health. He adds this is similar to the upgrading of one's personal credit score as it signifies lower borrowing interest rates for GPA and lower costs to rate payers. And the position remains vacant for a chief medical examiner. According to the Office of the Attorney General, the Commission on Postmortem Examinations has an ad out in the National Association of Medical Examiners for an ME. There have not been any applicants. And as we've reported, it's been nearly one year since Dr. Ariola Espinola retired. Now to those new allegations that challenge the president's defense just as his impeachment trial is starting. Soviet-born businessman Lev Parna says he worked closely with the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Gillian, Giuliani, trying to force Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden. And Parna says the president knew exactly what was going on. Ben Tracy reports from the White House. Pictures Lev Parnas gave to impeachment investigators show him with President Trump, his family, and his inner circle. But today, the president denied knowing him. I don't know him at all. Don't know what he's about. He lied. In a series I of explosive interviews, to... Parnas claims he was Rudy Giuliani's man on the ground in Ukraine, tasked with making sure an investigation into the Bidens was announced publicly. President Trump knew exactly what was going on. Uh, he was aware of all of my movements. Parnas alleges other top administration officials were also in the loop, including Vice President Mike Pence, then National Security Advisor John Bolton, and Attorney General Bill Barr. Attorney General Barr was basically on the team. The Justice Department says that's 100% false, and the White House argues Parnas is simply not credible. This is a man who's under, an indi under indictment and who's actually out on bail. Parnas does deny working with Trump donor Robert Hyde to have U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Marie Yovanovitch followed. The National Police of Ukraine. But today, the Ukrainian government opened an investigation into whether she was under surveillance, and the FBI searched Hyde's Connecticut home and office. Trump allies saw Yovanovitch as an obstacle to launching an investigation into the Bidens, even though the administration says she was removed for not supporting what it claims was its anti-corruption agenda. It was never about uh, corruption. It was never it was strictly about uh, the Burisma, which included Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. White House sources say these allegations by Parnas won't change the outcome of the impeachment trial, but they do acknowledge they have made things messy. Other sources say even more unsavory allegations could come out even after the Senate trial is over. And Pika's Cafe in Upper Tumon unveiled its new mural featuring the work of local artist John Bermudez. He's been working on the mural over the past month featuring his interpretation of the cafe's philosophy of eat local. It's an imperative statement, uh, which is basically uh, what the ethos are behind Pika's and, and what my personal ethos are, which is I think that we can do the best type of work in the world here, whether it's serving the best food or creating the best art or the best music or the best media channel in the world. You know, I think that um, that really all you really need is an internet connection to do some of the best things in the world. And so why, why not Guam, you know? Why, why can't we have the best things in the world, you know? Why can't we be providing the best, you know, work in the world? So eLocal, kind of encompasses that because with Guam, like everything, it all starts with the food, right? 
So if we're eating local, we're investing in the community. And I think for me to invest in the community as an artist is to do public art and also just do the best work possible. In 2015, Bermuda started Ladron Creative, a design collective which serves clients around the world. Coming up in sports, Double D has your dial rent to own athletes.